I don't know if you've ever thought about this or not, but we are a deal-making society. We enter into all kinds of deals and all kinds of arrangements. For example, some of you may have entered into a deal with a landlord for the apartment you rent. Or you may have entered into a deal with a mortgage company for the house that you're purchasing. And I would say all of us have entered into a deal with an insurance company uh, that they'll cover and take care of our stuff if something happens to it. We even enter into a, a deal with our spouse. If you're married, you've entered into an agreement with them. There's a set of, of obligations that you're expected to uphold. There's a set of, of rules you're expected to keep. No matter what the, the, the agreement or the, or the deal that you've entered into consists of, we all, at one time or another, and most all of us are in some kind of deal, some kind of arrangement right now, even as I speak. We even have expressions called up, holding up your end of the bargain. And that's what the other party expects. When we enter into the, to the deal, into the agreement, they expect us to keep our obligations, and we expect them to keep their obligations. In one of our readings uh, last week, uh, we find the Israelites not holding up their end of the bargain with God. You see, at Mount Sinai, they'd come out of Egypt, they were following the cloud. Moses was their leader. Aaron was the spokesman. They come all the way down to Mount Sinai and they enter into an agreement with God. Now, a real religious theological churchy talk would be they entered into a covenant with God. But in a covenant, it's nothing more than an arrangement. It's an agreement. It's a deal. So there at the mountain, out there in the wilderness, they enter into this covenant relationship, this deal with God. Moses, you see, had gone up on the mountain and he had received the Ten Commandments. You might say, this is part of the deal. So if you brought your Bibles with you, let's take a look at Exodus chapter 20 and let's, let's briefly look at this, this deal that God is offering the Israelites. Now he's giving them their end of the bargain and his end of the bargain is he's going to be their God. He's going to lead them. He's going to protect them. He's going to bless them. That's what he's going to do. He's going to be their, their personal God. But here's what he expects of them, and he gives them what we call the, the Ten Commandments here in Exodus chapter 20. I'm not going to read all. I'm just going to hit the first sentence in each verse there. But he says there in verse 3, You shall have no other gods before me. First commandment. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath, or in the waters below. Now you could say these are the first two commandments, and they are the most important commandments, because if they mess these up, these first two, then most likely uh, there's going to be breaking some other uh, commandments that follow. And as, as God's people, it's important to get the first two right. I've even compared this to buttoning up a shirt before. Actually, I heard somebody else do that, and it stuck with me. You know, if you get the first buttonhole right, what happens? Everything else lines up. What happens if you miss the first buttonhole? then it's just not lined up right. It's, it's out of whack. And it's the same with the commandments. You get the, get the first one right, really the first one, and then the rest of them are going to fall in line. Let's look at the next commandment. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Next one, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Next, honor your father and your mother. Next, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, etc. Those are the Ten Commandments. God gave them these commandments to help them live a better life. He gave them these commandments so they could get more out of life if they would just follow them. Wouldn't we have heaven on earth today? Pretty much. I mean, it wouldn't literally be, but it'd be a lot easier on this earth if every human being followed the Ten Commandments. What do y'all think? Yeah, man, we find them reiterated in the New Testament except for the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Uh, that's the only one we don't find. But the early Christians changed the day from Saturday to Sunday because that's the day that the Lord rose from the dead. So that's why we meet today. In Acts chapter 20, verse 7, they met on the first day of the week to break bread. So, so that's the only one that's a little different. The rest of them are just restated in the Old Testament. Anyway, Moses goes up, gets the Ten Commandments, and then after he gives the commandments to the people... We see an expansion of the commandments in, in the following chapters. We see uh, him talking in verse 22 about idols and altars. Uh, verse 21, Hebrew servants. 
And starting in verse 12, God elaborates on personal injuries, how they're to take care of that. Verse chapter 22, uh, personal property. Then, and it goes on to talk about a social responsibility. So laws of justice and mercy. And then God tells them about the three annual feasts. So the idea here is that God gives them the Ten Commandments, pretty straightforward, and then He he expands on the commandments and gets into more detail. But what I want you to see is how the people respond to God's deal He's offering to them. And we find their response in Exodus 24, verse 3. Listen to this. When Moses went and told the people all the Lord's words and laws... They responded with one voice. Everything the Lord has said, we will do. Let's have some audience participation. Let's say that all together. Everything the Lord has said, we will do. Man, that's, that's saying a lot, is it not? Everything the Lord has said, we will do. In other words, we are going to enter into this agreement with you, God. We're going to get in on this deal. We're going to be your covenant people. Everything looks like it's getting off to a good start. But it wasn't long until things went wrong. You see, after they had entered into this agreement, you could say that Moses went back up on the mountain to get a hard copy. He went up there to get the Ten Commandments that were, the the Ten Commandments were going to be inscribed on stone with the very finger of God. Don't you know that's kind of cool? His hand is laser putting these commandments on the stone. Anyway, he goes up there to get the hard copy, and as he's coming back down the mountain, man, he hears something. He hears a party. Think about that for a moment. What does it sound like when a bunch of people get together and they have a party? See, what had happened was Moses had stayed up there quite a while. I don't know why he'd stayed up there so long. He stayed up there for nearly six weeks. So he was gone. So they had entered into this agreement. Everything looked good. Moses goes back up on the mountain and he's conversing with God, getting the hard copy, but he stays up there a long time. He stays up there six weeks and while he's away, the people go to Aaron, kind of the second in charge, mouthpiece, and they begin to put pressure on him. And they tell Aaron to make them God's that will go before them. They said, as for this fellow Moses, we don't know what's happened to him. So, you know, he's he's up there for a little over a month. They haven't seen him. They don't know what's going on. They go to Aaron and say, look, make us some gods. Make us some gods that will go before us. In other words, we're not going to trust Yahweh anymore to lead us to the promised land. We want you to make us a god. Now, you'd expect Aaron to say, are y'all crazy? After what all we've been seeing and all these plagues falling, people getting killed left and right, are you you all out of your mind? That's what I would expect. But that's not at all. He, this peer pressure on him, he just caves right in and and says, uh, uh, well, y'all bring me your jewelry. And so they start taking off their their gold jewelry. And he he melts that jewelry down and makes a golden calf and he starts fashioning that thing. Probably made it look pretty good. and that Actually built a little altar in front of it. Next thing you know, the people are, are worshiping this golden calf and offering sacrifices to it. Now, now, to me, I'm like thinking, are these people crazy? I mean, what, are, they, are these people spiritual morons? What are they doing? I mean, they know full well that that, that, that thing that they're crafting with their hands can't, can't lead them and can't protect them and can't bless them. What are they thinking now? I'll give you my hunch. Down in Egypt, they did worship a bull god called Apis. And I suspect that this this calf somehow was associated with that bull god. I don't know exactly. Uh, I'm I'm just trying to get in their mindset. And maybe they thought this, this visual reminder would somehow bring them some luck. You know, people do that today. Sometimes they'll get a figurine or they'll get a little statue or they'll put a little St. Christopher around their neck or something. Oh, it's going to bring me some good luck, you know, attaching good luck to it. And they, maybe they thought, you know, this golden calf, this, this offspring of Apis maybe, is going to watch over us and protect us and we're going to worship it and bow down to it and offer sacrifices to it and, and that thing's going to get us all the way to the promised land. So the party starts. Apparently there was partying associated with this paganism that they were engaging in. Keep in mind, they were in a a very uh, 
idolatrous world back in Egypt. And they had left Egypt, but probably Egypt hadn't completely left them. So they were carrying some baggage with them. And the first time there's a little pressure, a little Moses is out of sight. Well, oh, oh, we're going to go revert back to our old ways. And so <clears throat> they start to, to party. Now, I don't know what all they were doing. I imagine they were shouting. I imagine there was some, uh, well, the scripture does tell us there was dancing. So you can say there were some gyrations going on. Uh, the Bible says in Exodus 32, verse 6, they indulged in revelry. This sometimes has sexual connotations. So if there was some sexual immorality going on at the party, they'd probably violated uh, commands 7 and 10 as well as verses uh, chap uh, commands 1 and 2. So they're probably breaking at least four of the Ten Commandments right here. Hadn't been, they hadn't entered into this covenant long at all, and here they are breaking these commandments. And as Moses is coming down the mountain, he hears all this partying. Probably the music's going. They're laughing. They're dancing, having a big celebration. And when Moses hears it and, and he realizes what's going on, he takes the stone tablets and throws them down and they break. I'm thinking, oh, no, man, that'd be so cool to have those things. I mean, with a museum, wouldn't a museum love to have those stone tablets inscribed with the very finger of God? This is precious. Oh, what are you doing, Moses? Why'd you throw it down? Well, first of all, he was angry. I mean, these people shouldn't have been doing that. They had just entered into this agreement with God. So he throws it down, and I think it's, it's symbolic, too, that they had broken the covenant, and therefore the covenant's broken. But we're just getting started. When he comes down, man, he is, he is really hot, man. He, he, he takes that, that golden calf, you know, I don't know, I, I picture him body slamming that thing. You know, he picks, I don't know, but he takes it and I'm going to say body slams it into the fire. I don't picture him gently easing it over to the fire. He takes it to the fire. He burns this thing up and then what's left of it, he grinds it into dust and grinds it into powder. And then he mixes it with water and makes the people drink it. Like, what? Why is he doing that? that? I don't know exactly. I think breaking of the, the tablets symbolize breaking the commandment. I get that. But what is this about making them drink this thing? Maybe it has something to do with in the sacrificial system. When they offered a sacrifice to God, they would get to eat some of, the, some of the meat. And I'd say that the meat tasted real good. And maybe this is a way of saying, well, how good does this God taste to you? You sacrificing to him, how does this taste? Maybe. Maybe some people even suggested, well, it's going to pass right through you and you're going to see it come out. And that's about what that God's worth. That could be it, too. I mean, he's, he's trying to get them to understand you do not want to involve yourself with idolatry. Again, what's amazing to me, though, in just a short period of time, you know, they had failed to keep this covenant agreement with God. And it's you know, when you're, when you're reading this for the first time, maybe some of y'all this past week have been reading, you saw that for the first time, you're like, what, shaking your head, what? I'm missing something here. By the way, I hope you're reading, following our Bible reading plan. It's on the website. Uh, I think we have some copies back there on the table. If you haven't started in January, go. it's cool right now. Go ahead and pick up and, and get started with us. And I'll be preaching a sermon out of one of the re week's readings. You can kind of try to guess and have some fun with it if you want to. The important thing is get in God's Word. It'll change your life. Anyway, if this is the first time you came to this, I'm sure you were shocked to find these people uh, so quickly falling off the bandwagon, so, so quickly turning their back on what God had planned for them. They wanted something apparently visible, something visible that they could see and put their trust in. A fellow by the name of Os Guinness points out that idolatry is the most discussed problem in the Bible. In fact, I've come to the conclusion that this is the most important topic that I could actually speak upon. There's nothing more important than this subject of idolatry and whether or not you are engaging in it. Now, most Christians uh, think it's one of the least meaningful notions. They don't think you know, today we're not going to get involved in idolatry. It just, it just seems so, uh, so primitive. Idolatry just seems so irrelevant. Yet, it's the number one issue in the Bible. And that should raise some caution signals. You know, idolatry practically comes into every book of the Bible. More than 50 of the laws in the first five books are aimed at this issue. And get this, in all of Judaism, it was one of only four sins to which the death penalty was attached. 
That lets you know how serious idolatry is. Now, many today uh, think this whole idea is, again, you know, obsolete. It seems like it was for back then and not now. And, you know, even though there's thousands of references in the Bible about it, now that has expired. It's just doesn't apply to us today. You know, you probably don't know anybody that literally kneels down before golden statues or bows before carved images. You might, but most of us probably don't. But what if I told you that every sin you're struggling with, every discouragement you're dealing with, even the lack of purpose some of you may be living with, is because of idolatry? Hmm. You see, idolatry doesn't have to be about statues. A statue doesn't even have to be involved. For example, Jesus says in, in Matthew 6, 25, he, says, uh, he, he, he basically he puts money in the category of a God, little g. He says, you cannot serve both God and money. I mean, you might expect him. So you cannot serve both Satan and God or, or God and Beelzebub or God and some, some cosmic deity out there that's hard to pronounce. He just says money. You can't serve both God and money. He's putting money in the category of a of God with a little g, or you could say an idol. The Apostle Paul, he does the same thing in Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. He lists greed, greed as idolatry. A greedy person is an idolatrous person. You see, idolatry takes place when we give something else other than God priority in our lives. Now let me say that again. Idolatry takes place when we give something else other than God priority in our lives. If you put anything before God, that becomes an idol. So there doesn't always have to be statues. Doesn't have to be strange sounding again, cosmic deities. No, we can do our kneeling, quote unquote, and our bowing with our imaginations, our checkbooks, our search engines, our calendars. Really, when you boil it all down, we're all serving something or someone. There's, there's no escape. Everybody in this room is serving something or someone. Everybody's got to serve somebody, old song says. There, there's no escaping it. You're just going to serve something or someone regardless. Uh, to serve and, and worship something is really, I think, hardwired into all of us. It, it's part of being human. And it's true of every culture and every civilization. Everyone worships. God created us to worship. You know, just as birds are created to fly and rivers are created to flow, uh, we are created to worship. It's what we do. The question for you is who or what will be the object of your worship? Idolatry is not only dangerous, it's very sneaky. It's stealthy. It's tricky. It can have you before you even know it. I was thinking of this morning as I partook of the Lord's Supper, I was thinking about how when I drink the juice, the Bible says that's the cup of the blood of the new covenant. The blood of the, it's, a, it's the deal. God's saying, I'm going to allow Jesus to die on the cross for your sins. You can be forgiven. You can have a relationship with me and you can go to the promised land, heaven for eternity. That's what God's offering. And he's, I'm coming back before him saying, you know, when I, when I drink that juice, I'm recognizing the covenant deal and I'm realigning my life if it's not lined up, right? I'm trying to get right with God, get back lined up and say, okay, God, I'm, I'm, I'm trying, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to, to keep up my end of the bargain, I'm trying to keep my end of the covenant deal. But I realize that as a Christian, you know, I, I have God's grace to cover me when I want to mess up. That's cool. Believe me, we have a killer deal, a great deal. And probably, you know, when we take the Lord's Supper and we drink, drink that juice, we need to analyze ourselves and say, are there any idols in my life? Is there anything that I've let creep into my life taking priority? Really, we need to think like that every time we drink that juice. Am I, am, I'm in covenant with you, God. You're still number one. You're the one on the throne of my heart. That's what we need to be thinking. 
reevaluating our covenant relationship with God. Again, though, it's very stealthy. It's very tricky. You could end up serving something that is very commendable. This is what makes idolatry so tricky. You could end up worshiping your family. Families are good to have. God created the family unit. He created this whole concept of a family. But if we're not careful, we can put the family ahead of God. It could be a career. It could be a worthy cause. It could even be feeding the hungry and, and healing the sick. They're all good things. But the instant one of these things takes the place of God, the moment it becomes an end of itself, rather than something we lay at the throne of God, it becomes an idol. You see, when something or someone, yeah, could be someone, replaces the Lord in His position of glory in our lives, then by definition, you would be guilty of idolatry. So my question is, what about you this morning? Are you serving any idols in your life? Is there a quote-unquote golden calf that you've been bowing down to? You see, another way to enter, another way to identify the idols in our lives is, is to look at the things that we create. Remember the first commandment of the ten basically says, have no other gods. And the second says, we shouldn't make any gods to worship, which is what the people ended up doing. You see, the profound wisdom of, of the second commandment is that anything in the world that can be hammered into an idol can become a false god. It can become misplaced priorities, something that takes the affections of our heart other than God. There's all kinds of things. I'll quickly name some things. A house that we constantly upgrade. It could, have, it could be becoming an idol in your life. You know, a promotion that you're just living to get with that corner office. That could become an idol in your life. Acceptance in a fraternity or a sorority. You're just Your whole world's revolving around that. It can become an idol in your life. The team that wins the championship. Oh, that's all you think about and what you're living for. That can become an idol. A body that is toned and well fit. Spend hours and hours pumping iron and lifting weights and doing this and doing that and posing in front of the mirror over and over. That toned body can become an idol. You know, we work hard at molding and sculpting and creating our own golden calves. And I already hear what some of y'all are thinking. You're thinking, well, John, you can say that about anything. You know, anything someone's devoted to, you can say that's an idol. That's my point. Exactly right. You have to be... Really, really careful. An, an, idol is, an idol is anything that takes our passion and puts it in place of God. It could be watching NFL football. It, it, it could be jogging and running and bicycling and boating and skiing. I could just go on and on. Anything that takes our passion, instead of, instead of it being a passion for God, that becomes an idol. Do you see how dangerous it can be? You see, anything that becomes the purpose or driving force of our life points to idolatry of some kind. So think about what you're pursuing right now, what you've maybe created, and ask yourself, why? Why are you doing it? Why are you doing the things that you do? So what I'm going to spend the next few minutes on is I want to ask you some diagnostic questions. I didn't come up with these questions, but I, I came across them in my studies, and they really really made me think, you know, probably, probably wouldn't be a bad idea to put these on the screen during communion or something so we could review these questions and, and, and ask ourselves, are we bowing to any idols in our lives? And I, I, I believe that every day that goes by, gods with a little g are competing uh, for the throne of our heart. Every day. It's not just something you put down and walk away from. It's, it's all the time these other things trying to get on the throne of your heart. So I'm going to ask you some diagnostic questions, and you don't have to answer out loud. But I want you just to, to, to think about them for just a moment. First question is, what are you most disappointed with? When we feel overwhelmed with disappointment, it's a good sign that something has become far more important to us than it should be. 
disproportionate disappointment reveals that we have placed intense hope and long and longing in something other than God. You see, where we put our hope reveals our God or our idol. I'm going to put these questions on the screen. You can maybe write them down and think about them. They're good devotion time. Okay, can't do that this morning. Sorry. Uh, what do you complain about the most? Now, this one might be hard for you to answer, but try to ask somebody that's around you on a fairly regular basis, try to get an objective opinion and ask them, what do you hear me complaining most about? You know, our complaints reveal a lot about us. If you're constantly complaining about your financial situation, maybe money or materialism has become too important to you. If you constantly complain about a lack of respect at work, Maybe what other people think about you has become too important. You know, if you constantly complain about what kind of year your team is having, again, you know, maybe, maybe sports has become too important to you. What we complain about reveals what really matters to us. Whining really shows what has power over us in our life. Where do you make your financial sacrifices? You know, Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You know, where our money goes shows what God is winning the battle for our heart. So take a look at your bank statement and maybe your credit card bills and pretend you're examining the bills of a complete stranger. You're looking at their spending habits. You're trying to find out what's the most important to that stranger. And then flip the switch and say, hey, that's my bank statement. Those are my bills. Man, th that really shows where the priorities are when you look at that checkbook and those bank statements. What worries you? It could be the idea of losing a job, losing a significant other. Uh, maybe it's the idea of worried about being ridiculed. Maybe it's being alone. Whatever it is that wakes you or keeps you up has the potential to be an idol. So when you put too much emphasis on something, it reveals the idol. Where do you go when you hurt? Now say you have a hard day at work. If you come home, where do you go? Some people go to the refrigerator for comfort food. Some ice cream maybe. Or they pick up the phone and call a friend and vent. Some people read novels, watch movies, play video games, click on a little porn. Where do you go for your emotional rescue? Here's what the Bible says in Psalm 46, verse 1. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. You see, where we go in times of trouble says a lot about uh, who we are serving. What infuriates you? You know, everyone has a hot button or two, uh, something we say that makes us crazy. Are you so competitive you can't stand it when your team loses? Could it be that being the best is your idol? How do you respond in traffic? When someone cuts you off or drives too close or speeds up and won't let you in, um, I ask you, why does a complete stranger have so much power over your emotions? What about when someone embarrasses you or doesn't treat you with respect? What is the real issue? Maybe your quick temper reveals the oldest idol of them all, the God of me. What about your dreams? The places we choose for our imagination to go, you know, what fantasy grips your mind? What puts a twinkle in your eye? You know, do you dream about being the next American Idol? I know that's not on anymore, but you get the point. Maybe the ne next uh, first round draft pick. You know, aspirations are fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But why are you aspiring to these things? That's the question. Is your motivation to give God glory or is your motivation for your own glory, your own fame, your own fortune? So you have to be careful. It's so easy for something other than God 
to get on the throne of our heart. It's a good sign that you're here this morning. I can't think of a better thing you can do to give God the first day of the week. That, that, that's a good sign. I mean, I know people can come here and leave here and live like the devil all week long. I know that. But I'd like to believe most of us aren't like that. You know, if you gave God the first 10% of your income, that's a good sign. It's showing you got your priorities straight with the money. Money don't have a hold on you. If you find time to get in the Word, you know, I think it's good to get in the Word first thing in the morning. That's not a thou shalt in the Bible. I realize that. But it's a good habit to get in. Give God the first few minutes of your day. There's, there's, there's things that you, you can do to give, give God the first part. Give Him first. Keep Him first. Keep Him the most important thing in your life. So yes, idols come to us in many forms. Only the names have changed. If you're a Christian, I, I beg you, keep vigilance over your life. Keep watch. Keep your life free of idols. And we all need to constantly make sure we're holding up our end of the bargain. Let's pray.